Please welcome Laura Poitras. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> Thanks for being here. Uh, it's, it's really such an honor to, to show this film at this festival. Um, but actually, before you dive in, um, there are people Please. who are in the film that, um, that I'd like to acknowledge and, and thank. So um, I believe Glenn Greenwald is here. Where's Glenn? <laughs> William Binney. You and you and McCaskill, I believe, is here. Uh, David Miranda. I think th I think that's it. If I'm if I'm missing, I think that's for who's here. Um, and I wanted to do one other thing that we couldn't do last night. We um, uh, at the after the premiere is is to it's, and it's actually also somewhat relating to the film is to is to thank the funders who supported this film, and um, uh, they came on board in the most unusual circumstances because when we um, approached each of them, we asked them to to be incredibly discreet about the film and about the contents of the film. They, all of them, made trips to Berlin to watch the cut. They, in some cases, didn't actually know what the final film would be until the end. We had redaction s scenes that we showed because we, for source protection reasons, until we were ready to, to release it. And I know for the New York Film Festival, for, we did a screening um, for, the, for the festival committee and you know, we scheduled it here, but then we moved them to another location and we had the actually the end was redacted and some other things. So everybody has been, uh, everyone who supported this film has taken an enormous leap, leap of faith and, and it has kept confidences that we've asked them to, to keep um, for the purpose so that we could do our work as securely as possible until we were ready to release it. So, um, so I'm grateful to all the people who supported this film, not just for their support, but for their sensitivity to the, the demands of this film. So I'm, I'm gonna have to name them, so. Um, first and foremost, um, uh, Radius, who's distributing the film. Um, um, Tom Quinn came to Berlin um, in February and he said, and he'd heard about the film and knew we were working on it and said that he wanted to be involved and we showed him some footage and they've been uh, extraordinary in their support and in, in not, um, you know, I think their instinct as distributors, like shouldn't we announce that we're involved in it and, and they, you know, totally listened to what we needed which was to remain as discreet as possible for as long as possible. Um, Participant media, um, Diane Weyerman is a dear friend and um, we've um, known each other for, for years and she was one of the biggest supporters on the film that I made in Iraq. Um, and I uh, worked with her when she was at Sundance right after I came back from Baghdad and I was in a, you know, uh, it, you know I was still shell-shocked from the experience and, and she supported that film and we've always wanted to work together and never really knew how we'd make it happen. And she made a trip to Berlin, I think, in the festival and we talked and, and she said, you know, this is something I think we could do. You know, this is a film about journalism. and, um, and she went to, to um, the people she works with and said, you know, we're going to fund a film, but you're not going to know anything about it. You're not going to know the title of it. You're not going to um, uh, have any details. And, and they came on board. And so I'm incredibly grateful to participant for, for, their, for their trust. Um, HBO um, documentary films. I don't know if Sheila's here. Um, OK, anyone from HBO? Okay, so um, this was extraordinary that, th that they've come on board. I mean, they've, um, Sheila saw the film and loved it, and she's, you know, she's a champion of, of Verte filmmaking, and I think it spoke to her, but she's also been so extraordinary in supporting our desire to have a theatrical life for the film, so. Um, 
uh, Bertha Foundation and Brit Doc have been one of the first supporters, and, um, and Jess Search has been tireless in her support for this film and getting it into the world. Um, uh, Channel 4 is also one of, uh, was a broadcast supporter in the, in the, in the UK. Um, David Menchel and Vital Projects Fund, David is the executive producer and, and has been supporting some of the most progressive documentary films. And uh, uh, I have only three more. So, um, uh, <laughs> uh, NDR and BR, which is our, our broadcaster in, in Germany, um, they've approached us immediately. I mean, uh, much of the reporting that I've done has been uh, based in, in, in Berlin, and they've been, you know, tireless in, in their support. Um, uh, and and CineReach. So I'd like to thank them and Sundance. So thank you so much. And <laughs> Okay. Um, there's... There's a lot to talk about, um, but I'll start with 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 this with a big multifaceted question. Um, I was hoping you could talk a little bit about just balancing the needs uh, between reporting and breaking a new story and and being part of that story and also making a film. And do you mean that like in terms of what's in the film, or sort of working both reporting and making the film yeah. at the same time? Um, because you were in that hotel room, and obviously you did release, you know, video, and were part of that. You you, you were part of that story breaking um, a little over a year ago, but at the same time you had this longer term film right. in mind. Yeah, I mean it's been a complicated sort of navigating roles um, th while making this film. I mean in the months when I was receiving the the emails from Snowden, uh, I was also in the process of making a film about surveillance, and I had an idea that of course this would find its way into that film. Um, and I was very much, you know, that relationship was, you know, a source journalist relationship, and he was claiming to to have evidence of um, NSA surveillance. And uh, and but when it sort of became clear um, that I would meet him, um, and I should contextualize it. For a long time, I thought that I was in dialogue with somebody who was an anonymous source that I would never meet, never knew who they are. That I would receive documents, and and that we that I would, you know, team up with people and we would report. Um, at, I think it was in, in April where he communicated to me that, in fact, his identity would be revealed, that he didn't intend to remain anonymous, and that his identity would be revealed. And both because it would be you know, discovered and because he didn't want to remain in, in the shadows. And when he told me that um, is when I sort of said, okay, well, as a filmmaker, then I said, then really we need to meet, and I want to be able to film you. And his first response was, was no. He said that he that the story isn't about him; it's about the issues, and that he wanted that to be um, what people focused on. And I responded by saying that, well, the fact that you know he's putting his life on the line to reveal this information was very important for the public to know, and that only he can answer that question, and that the documents won't speak to that. And uh, he he also had a serious concern that if um, you know, he had taken this, these, these enormous risks to make this information available, and he was concerned about us being in the same place at the same time, because there was a risk that if we got shut down, that the information maybe wouldn't, you know, reach the public. So that was another, he had a security concern about actually physically meeting. But I was able to convince him of the importance that only he could speak to the motivations um, uh, of coming forward, and that, and that he, even if he chose not to be part of the story, he would be, because the, the press would, would report on him. So then he, um, he uh, agreed to meet. And so when I went to Hong Kong um, with, with Glenn and Ewan, uh, I was very clear that my job was as a documentarian, like as a visual journalist, that I wasn't there to you know, look at the you know to to study the archive or to report on it. At that moment, I was there to document this moment of of journalism, really, and what and how Glenn and Ewan worked with him in, in in receiving this information and reporting on it. And that I felt that if if there's anything I could contribute to understanding this, that that's sort of what my whatever unique skill sets were, where their you know are um, you know their writing and and the reporting would would. Um, would would break the news, you know, where I would sort of document this historic event that was happening in Hong Kong. And so I was very clear that's that's what my role was. I wasn't um, looking at the archive of reporting. But then when I when he he went underground and I returned to Berlin, it was very clear that I had an obligation to report. I mean that he had put, you know, risked so much and that I had to then sort of shift 
um, my focus and and look at the archive and, and report on it. And that's when I started teaming up with, um, with Der Spiegel and, and other news organizations to report. But there has been this strange, you know, push-pull, like we, you know, you see, the, you know, we are reporting on the Merkel story and I'm also filming. I mean, there everything about this film is kind of, you know, looped in on itself. And I mean, that's very much why it was necessary that it, the film have a subjective voice, mm -hmm. you know, in it, so that the audience knows that I'm not an outsider, that I'm also a participant in the events that are unfolding. Could you talk about that a bit, actually? Because um, uh, this is the third film in your in your post 9/11 uh, trilogy, um, and I think it differs from the other two in in several significant ways. I think the most obvious one being that you are a um, you know a, a participant in the story um and um it's you are not present in the other two films um can you talk about the 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 thought process and, and how yeah. you arrived at yeah, you sure. know, i mean <laughs> not unlike snowden i actually didn't want to be in this film as my editor as matilde <laughs> would testify to that i had to be no but it was clear that i had to be you know uh, that i had to be present in in the film um uh because the audience had a right to know that I was a participant in the events. Um, but the question of how to be sort of subjective, it's, it's a complicated one for these three films. And the, when I made the film in Iraq, I was filming with uh, Iraqi civilians, and it was a very dangerous time to be working in Iraq, and, but I didn't want to be the focus be on, on the Western journalist you know, in a dangerous conflict zone, because then sort of all the em empathetic energy could sort of move towards me rather than the people that I actually wanted to be um, the focus of the story. So in, that, so in Iraq, it was, I absolutely didn't want to draw any attention to the circumstances of how I was working or any risks that I might face, because it was about having people understand what the, the occupation is like from the perspective of uh, Iraqis and, and, and the US military. So I'm very invisible in that film. I mean, I, I always think that, you know, obviously there's a camera there, so I'm, I'm sort of part of it, you know, I'm, I've been invited, so I'm, I'm present. With the oath, it was a, actually a complicated one. Um, we, I approached it in the same way, which is sort of a verte, where I'm sort of, you know, watching scenes unfold. But um, Jonathan Oppenheim, who edited it, um, at some point we, he was, we were doing test screenings before we finished, and, he's, and he was aware there was a, an uneasiness am, amongst the audience that we didn't acknowledge the presence of the camera because the access was sort of so unusual, and sort of like, how is there a camera here? So we realized that we were taking the viewer outside of the story by not acknowledging the uh, the presence, my presence. So he then changed and put my voice in a few things, and so and and yeah, and this one, you know, it begins with, I think this film begins with I, you know, I was placed on a watch list, etc. And so it's the f it's certainly the first film that I've done um, from a uh, first person. Um, can you maybe backtrack a little bit uh, and talk about how this project emerged um, and what where it was going before Snowden arrived um, on you know before before that first email? Uh, I know that. The idea was to make a film about surveillance, which obviously is a large, abstract, invisible subject. Um, and what were you doing in the you know in the I know you've been working on this since the oath, and what were you doing in the, in the years before? And obviously, some of the I think some of the p figures that you were following are still in this film, obviously. Yeah, um, I mean, w w this film actually began in the spring of 2011. Um, and I was interested, like, in, in the theme of surveillance, it was also when WikiLeaks was coming out, and I was interested in the work that they were doing, which also related to journalism. So I was interested in, in, in these themes, um, and I was working on trying to figure out what access, I mean, oftentimes my work, it's about, you know, some, there's some themes I'm interested in, and then it's like trying to figure out how how I can, you know, follow, or what 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 will take me on a journey that will help me understand those things. And so, uh, but in, actually in the spring of 2011, I didn't quite know, but I was really interested in this, you know, this guy who was blogging for salon.com. <laughs> and uh, and he, he was down in Rio and he was, you know, like I was reading him all the time and he was just doing this really fierce journalism, um, totally outside of the mainstream. And, um, and, and, I, and I loved his work and I didn't quite know what the film and how it would come together, but I, I said, well, okay, let's, why don't I get on a plane and, you know, spend some time with him. And, and so that's when I, you know, first filmed with Glenn and I was with Kirsten Johnson, the cinematographer, and, and it's the opening, it's, you know, it turns out to be the opening um, of the film and he's at, the, at that very moment writing about Jane Mayer's um, uh, article about Thomas Drake, who's an NSA whistleblower, who was um, at that point um, uh, facing espionage charges. So it's, 
ironically, that that's sort of the very, very short first shoot. Um, uh, and then sort of the film expanded. I actually reached out to Bill Binney at, at exactly that time, right after the New Yorker piece broke. Um, so I actually called Bill from Rio. So the sort of origins happened there. And But then I started expanding, and I did um, a lot of filming um, with Julian Assange and WikiLeaks, and also Jacob Applebaum, who you see in the film, um, uh, the Tor project, and I was very interested in, yeah, surveillance, people who, resistance movements, um, uh, people who are working, you know, activists. I mean, this was sort of in the, sort of the aftershock of the, the Arab Spring, so I, I was filming in Tunisia, where Jake was working, and also Egypt, and and then, so we were actually, Mathilde and I were editing, you know, that film, and then Snowden started to, to email, and uh, what happened was, I mean, in the end, we realized, in the editing room, we realized we actually have two films. You know, there was, a, there was that, that because of the material that I shot around Snowden and the way that Hong Kong, we knew, would, would occupy a large piece of the film, um, it kind of dictated what this film would be. Like, we, for a while, we, th we had a lot more material before we arrived at Hong Kong, and then it just, it was very hard to shift gears. It was like you opened a different story, you know, midway through, and so we realized that there were, there, there were two films and that this one was going to sort of focus on, on, on Snowden. Um, but yeah, but it, it was, it, you know, it was a decision that we made in the, in the editing room that, that, that there, that there's material for two films. Um, can you talk a little bit about shaping the material in the hotel room, uh, which it's, I think it's, it's a full hour of the film. Um, it's, it's sequenced chronologically, but um, it's, it's, I think it's just amazing how it's shaped, you know, in terms of like the, how you allow for humor to come into it as well, um, and the su the sense of suspense uh, as 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 that sequence plays out. Um, how much did you shoot? Uh, I mean, in terms of the structure of this, I mean, I don't, you know, Mathilde is here, the, my extraordinary artistic collaborator on this film, who's, you know, is yeah, please. <laughs> And and I actually would say like she should come down and actually address. I mean, I would I would love to invite you down to to answer that question. <laughs> I mean, I can say she's as she's walking down after I came back. I mean, I was a bit. It was a kind of a traumatic shoot in the sense that. I, the stakes were really high in the room and not knowing, and so she was the one who sort of took the f took took the footage and was the first one to watch it before then I you know started to see when she made selects. So, yeah, what was the question? <laughs> in terms of how the shaping of the of the, the Hong Kong material and and how yeah the structure and, and how much material. Yeah, I think we had some. We, I, I didn't really count the hours, but I think we had something like 20 hours of footage for, for Hong Kong. Maybe that's a bit exaggerated, maybe, but that's around the, the time we had. And um, it was what was particularly difficult about it was that it was all extraordinary. All of it was completely extraordinary. We could have, we could have taken anything, more or less, and it would have been shocking and, and beautiful. So the, the, the difficulty was to, to, make dis to, to, to make choices knowing that we left out uh, passages that would have been also mind-blowing. Uh, that's one of the aspects of it, but of course very soon what we also noticed that was that we needed to follow a very clear narrative line, which was that of uh, a story unfolding in that verite style, which is almost like a fiction film. You, you follow things as they happen. And um, the more we did that, the more we started to understand that um, we could not go into certain directions. For example, we had to steer clear from um, opinions, uh, statements that Snowden made that were very beautiful and that were very uh, compelling also in, in what he's, because of course you notice he's extremely articulated and very uh, thoughtful person. And so he made extraordinary statements that we were very tempted to use, but then as af after a while we noticed that we could not use them because we, it was taking us out of this narrative uh, form that we were finding. So that was one of the main discoveries we made, and um, right. And then, of course, after after a while, we had to streamline what we were what we were saying. Yeah, but then. Uh, 
Uh, we'd love to take some questions from the audience. Okay, many hands. Uh, you do? Okay, great. So is somebody going to call on the audience, or should I? I will? Okay. Um, let's start there. Yes? Uh, first of all, thank you very much uh, for this uh, movie and for this documentary. I was wondering if you could speak a little bit. In a, two occasions, Snowden talks about uh, the drone program and its effect on his decision making. Um, could you say something more about it or how he articulated the reasons for his um, reaching out to you? I mean, you know, uh, I think the reference that we included where he says that, you know, one of the motivations is, is you know, being in the NSA and seeing, you know, the escalation of the, the drone program as, as, as and, and also, you know, how he articulates that, you know, hope that, that, there, that some of these policies would be reined in and they weren't and that there was these kind of um, escalations in certain, in certain policies. And, and so it's, it's actually really what you, you know, we, we show you what, what he says on that, which is that it's one of the things that, that brought him forward was, was about the drone program. And I can say, obviously, it's echoed at the end, you know, when, when it's um, brought, when somebody else also um, comes forward to, to, to expose the, the, this program. Hi. Uh, thank you for your bold filmmaking. I was just curious, how does um, Edward Snowden feel about living now in Russia? I mean, in general, I, I, I avoid speaking on, on his behalf. I mean, I think though, but I think you can say that I, he, 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 I think he's grateful to have political asylum. I think he's not aligned with, you know, all of the, you know, the, the political reality there. But I think that he made the choice that he, you know, didn't, didn't feel that, that, that staying, you know, in the U.S. Was an, was an option for him. So I think he's, you know, but I, I think he's also, um, I, I, I think he's keeping options open if, if there are other possible countries to, for him to seek asylum. Yes, am I on now? Um, so my question is, um, I didn't understand the urgency to, rele to, to put stories out while you were in the hotel room, because um, none of those stories were, in, to my perception, time sensitive. Um, so my question is, why wasn't more care given to the plan for what would happen to ensure Snowden's safety rather than, I mean, all of a sudden there was this crazy environment created. I don't understand the reason for that. Does my question make sense? And then related to that is, was there really, really no plan beyond what we see in the film for what Snowden would do to ensure his safety? Right, okay. Um, I, I mean, I think that the, in terms of a timeline, um, I mean, uh, let me step back and say that um, I didn't know that he was leaving the country until he had actually already left. You know, we were in dialogue. I'd come back to New York to set up a time to meet him, thinking I was going to, you know, suburban Maryland or something. And then he left the country. And I think that that's actually when the time started, you know, ticking in terms of his, you, you don't leave the country and, and, you know, work for the NSA without it being noticed. And so there was a bit of, um, uh, comp whatever, urgency in terms of, um, uh, of publishing because uh, his absence would be noticed. Um, and then in terms of his, like what, what we knew of or what I knew of um, his, you know, what he was going to do next. I mean, my experience until working with him was like as, as a source, he would tell me something which would then tell me what I needed to know to, you know, like he said, you know, I'm going to have information. And then he said, well, here is where you can download it and et cetera. And then I, I actually, W thought that may that maybe I just didn't know what the next step was is is part of the answer, um, and yeah, what you see, and then I realized, or what we realized um, in Hong Kong is that all of his planning did actually end there, you know, that that actually was, and that um, and that when you know the lawyers came in, that that you know they then. Um, uh, helped him, you know, go underground, and so. Uh, but in terms of the time, I mean, I think that, and you know, uh, and Glenn can also speak to this. I think there was uh, a, f a need 
like that, that it was important that we publish um, on, and quickly because um, to get the story out and um, and to sort of have the uh, you know public awareness of it um, happen unfold. And, and I can say one other thing: we we that since he had come decided that he would reveal his identity, we actually wanted to do that before it was it. it was announced by the government, and it's clear that as soon as Glenn's Verizon story, you know, that's when when they come to to Lindsay's uh, and his home. So we knew that the that the government was aware that he was missing, and so we wanted to, to we wanted him to have the first chance to say why he did what he did. Uh, yes, Laura, I'm wondering if you uh, did you encounter any problems coming back into the U.S. this time for the screening, or have you had any kind of bounce back personally from? Big Brother on all of this. <laughs> um, you know, I've had years of being stopped at the border, and and actually that did that I stopped being interrogated at the border in 2012. Actually, after Glenn um, wrote a piece about it, and and they they did stop doing that. Um, uh, and in, in terms of coming back, I didn't have any problems. Um, uh, you know, and I haven't been contacted by, by the U.S. government uh, regarding this reporting. I think this is going to be the last question, but just a reminder that we have a talk with Laura at 4 o'clock as well. Hi, Laura. Um, I and my organization represent a number of civilian victims of drone attacks, people at the sharp end of the chain that you show at the end of your program. And there's something about the movie I have a hard time sort of reconciling, which is that you guys have exposed a system that is unbelievable in its sophistication and its power. I mean, the kind of short version is that we all live in the panopticon, right? But the civilian victims of drone attacks are an example of the limits of that system and the way that, notwithstanding how powerful metadata collection is, the mistakes are made. And what I, what I can't understand and what I can't reconcile is, how does that happen? Does, to you, does it speak more to the indifference of the United States government to the lives of people in Yemen and Pakistan who die, or to the limits of the technology, or some mixture of both? I mean, I mean the mistakes. I mean, let's let's just say. I mean, I would you know I would say that you know the drone program, whether or not they. I mean, it's 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 outrageous that we have a drone program that where we're you know targeting people um, and and killing them, uh, whether or not the, you know the, is based on metadata or anything. You know that, that that we you know we think of democracies as having something called the rule of law, and that's what you know what you know does the drone program will never align itself with that. Um, but in terms of yeah, I mean, I think they're actually you know they there is indifference to civilian. I mean, we know that from you know I, I spend time in Iraq. There is indifference to to civilian ca casualties, um, and. Uh, you know, and hopefully that changes, and hopefully we'll continue to do reporting that will hopefully have some impact and, and raise awareness um, for the civilian consequences of particularly the drone program. Great. That's, that's all the time we have for, but uh, Laura, thank you very much for being here. Thank you all for coming. <laughs>